Welcome back to AP Chemistry. I'm Jeremy Krug, and in this video, we're learning about solutions, solubility, and equilibrium, and specifically, the equilibrium of saturated ionic solutions. By the way, if you haven't already done so, I'd like to encourage you to subscribe to my channel since this is a part of my complete AP Chemistry course series here on YouTube. Well, let's get started. Now, earlier in this AP Chemistry course, we learned that if you have a mixture of gases, well, there's this thing called equilibrium, right? Where at some point the, the rate of the uh, forward reaction is gonna be equal, as the, equal to the rate of the reverse reaction, and you'll be able to calculate an equilibrium constant. Well, guess what? It's not just gases that this can work for, or solutions. You know, saturated solutions are also at equilibrium. And so, if you wanna take an example of that, Let's say we have lead to chloride. Now, earlier in this course, we learned that there are some uh, compounds that are generally soluble in water. And we learned you know, what compounds those would be. And we talked about some compounds that are generally insoluble in, insoluble in water. We learned some, some rules for that. And one of the compounds that we said was generally insoluble was lead to chloride. So that's this, this PBCl2 here. Now, what we'll find in the laboratory is that if we take lead to chloride, it's generally insoluble, but that means that you, that you just can't dissolve very much of it in water. You actually can dissolve a very tiny amount of that compound in water, or at least at room temperature, 25 degrees Celsius. Well, guess what? We can take that amount of lead to chloride that can be dissolved in water, and we can calculate an equilibrium constant for the, for the dissolving of that substance. And we can do that for any other ionic compound as well. Now let's see how that works. First of all, it might be helpful to talk about the reaction that describes the dissolving of this lead to chloride solid in water. Well, the way we do that is we just write it out as an ionic compound in its solid form, and it's gonna dissociate dissolve, essentially, break apart into its component ions. We have some lead two ions here, and we have some chloride ions as well. And don't forget to balance the equation. Since we have two, a two down here, we have to show that there are two chlorides produced as well. Now, if you want to write an equilibrium constant expression for this process, remember, it's done in just the same way as all the others that we did uh, back in, for example, lesson 17, when we first learned to write an equilibrium constant expression. It's products over reactants raised to the power of the coefficients. And of course, we always leave out pure liquids and pure solids. And guess what? We do have a solid that we have to leave out. So the equilibrium constant expression is going to be the concentration of lead ions times the concentration of chloride ions squared. And of course, that squared is derived from the fact that there's a 2 right here. So products over reactants raise the power of the coefficients. And of course, there really are no reactants to put into this expression because the lead to chloride is a solid. Now, whenever we write this equilibrium constant expression, it is in moles per liter. So we could call it Kc, I suppose. But specifically, we're talking about the solubility of this compound lead to chloride. So it's, it's the solubility product. So that's why we call this KSP. The SP stands for solubility product. And so this is what we're gonna be using in this lesson. We're calculating KSPs. This is adding to our alphabet of equilibrium constants because we had uh, KC, we've had KP, and now we're adding KSP. And we're gonna be adding a few more here in the upcoming lessons later on in the course once we talk about acids and bases. Now, let's work a problem with this here. Let's say that we actually go into the laboratory and we find that at a certain temperature, at 25 degrees Celsius, for example, we can dissolve a maximum of 4.51 grams of lead to chloride solid into one liter of solution. So let's calculate the molar solubility of lead to chloride, and we're also gonna calculate the equilibrium constant, this KSP that we're talking about. Well, part A, the molar solubility, all that means is 
What's the solubility of this stuff in moles per liter? That's what molar just means. What is it in moles per liter? Well, guess what? We have it in grams per liter, you know, 4.51 grams per liter. All we have to do is convert this to moles per liter. So it's just a simple conversion as it turns out. So we're going to take the 4.51 grams of lead 2 chloride per 1 liter and we're going to convert that to moles per liter. So all we have to do is in our conversion factor here, we're going to have to put grams on the bottom so that the grams will cancel out. And we're converting to moles, so that means moles, one mole, has to go on top. So now we just have to look at the periodic table to find out how many grams are in one mole of this stuff right here, PBCl2. And we can add it up and find that it is about 271.8. So, or 278.1, excuse me. So now we can cancel grams top and bottom and do this division here. And we find that the answer is 0 0.0162 moles per liter. So guess what? That means that the molar solubility of lead to chloride is just, you know, 0 0.0162 a molar PBCl2. And that's how you find the molar solubility, just a simple uh, grams to mole conversion here. Now let's find the KSP. Remember, we're going to have to plug into the uh, equilibrium constant expression. But we have to figure out the concentration of the lead ions and the concentration of the chloride ions in this saturated solution. Well, guess what? We just figured out that lead to chloride is 0.0162 molar. So this is a 1 to 1 ratio for lead, so that's going to be 0.0162 molar. But it's a 1 to 2 ratio lead chloride to chloride. So how do we find the concentration of chloride? Well, we have to multiply it by 2, don't we? Because it's a 2 to 1 ratio. So when we do that, we find that chloride's concentration is 0.0324 molar chloride. Well now with these numbers right here we can plug these into the equilibrium constant expression that we got earlier. So you might recall this is what we had. And if you forgot we can write it again. You know products over reactants raise the power of the coefficients. That 2 there. So now we just plug it in, plug and chug, and we get the uh, put these numbers into the equation. And when we plug that in, 0.0162 times 0.0324 squared, we find that KSP for this is about 1.7 times 10 to the negative fifth. And so we've just calculated the equilibrium constant for the dissolving of this lead to chloride in, in water at that temperature. So that's the KSP. And we could look it up in the literature, maybe online or something, and hopefully we'd find that we got an answer that was pretty close to the real answer for KSP. Now, when we talk about KSP, what uh, does that mean? Well, let's try another example here. Let's go the other direction. Let's say we have the KSP for iron 2 sulfide is 8.0 times 10 to the negative 28th. So let's go through these steps here. First of all, let's write the equation for the dissociation of iron 2 sulfide in water. Well, the first thing you have to do is know what iron 2 sulfide is, right? It's, it's FES. And so when it breaks apart, we're going to have some iron 2 ions, and we're going to have some sulfide ions. And it's a one-to-one -one ratio, so there's our balanced equation. So that's part A. Now part B says, write the equilibrium constant expression for this process. Once again, just like we did back in lesson 17, and in the last example too, you know, products, overreactants, raise the power of the coefficients, all our coefficients are 1, and of course, we're going to leave out the FES solid, aren't we? So that's, that stuff right there is not going to be in it. So KSP is the concentration of iron 2 times the concentration of sulfide. And so that's part B. Now, part C. Let's calculate the molar solubility of the iron 2 sulfide in water. Well, this time, we don't know what the molar solubility is, is it? In fact, that's our unknown. In the last example, we knew what that was. 
but this time we don't. So let's call the concentration of FES here, let's just call that X, since we don't know what it is. We'll, we'll leave that as an unknown. Now, that means that if it's a one to one ratio, the concentration of iron to ions should be X, shouldn't it? You know, it's a one to one. And guess what? The sulfide is a one, so that's also going to be X as well, isn't it? So now we can plug and chug into the KSP expression that we wrote earlier. So you might recall in the last problem, we were trying to solve for KSP. Well, guess what? This time we know what it is. We can just take that number up here and plug it in. So KSP is 8.0 times 10 to the negative 28th, and the iron ion concentration and the sulfide ion concentration, those are both X. So we're going to plug those in here. And so essentially we have x squared equals 8.0 times 10 to the negative 28th. And just take the square root, and we find that x equals 2.83 times, times 10 to the negative 28th. So guess what? x back here was our uh, molar solubility, wasn't it? So that means that the molar solubility of the iron 2 sulfide is 2.83 times 10 to the negative 28th moles per liter of the iron 2 sulfide. It's, it's very insoluble, isn't it? That's, that's hardly anything at all. Well, let's take this and calculate or de determine part D. Calculate the solubility of iron 2 sulfide in grams per liter. So here we have it in moles per liter. This is just a, a mole to gram conversion, isn't it? We're, we're going to take the 2.83 times 10 to the negative 28th moles of iron 2 sulfide for one liter, and we're going to convert that to grams. So way down here at the end, we're going to have grams per liter. And this is just a, a mole to gram conversion. So that means moles will go on the bottom, and grams will go on top. And we just use the periodic table to add that up. So I think that's about 87.91. And so we cancel moles top and bottom. And when you multiply this time, we find that the solubility of the iron 2 sulfide is about 2.5 times 10 to the negative 26th grams of iron 2 sulfide in one liter. That's hardly anything at all, isn't it? So we can say, it is very safe to say, that at least at this temperature, you know, this 25 degrees Celsius, iron 2 sulfide is almost completely insoluble in water, isn't it? That's hardly anything at all. So very, very insoluble. So when we think about this, we, we've just done two examples. We had one example that was you know, a little bit soluble, where we could calculate a few, or where we could dissolve a few grams in a liter. And here, there's hardly any, you know, hardly any grams per liter to dissolve. So let's think about the significance of KSP. If you have a, a KSP that is very small, like the one we just had, like 10 to the minus 28th, then that thing is hardly going to dissolve at all, isn't it? But if you, if you have a larger value for KSP, like the 1.7 times 10 to the minus fifth that we had a few minutes ago, that's a little bit more soluble, isn't it? So the larger the magnitude of KSP, the more soluble it is. So let's say that we have these two compounds. These are both fairly insoluble, but which of those two is going to be the more soluble? If we compared the, the zinc sulfide and the barium sulfate. Do you see which one it's going to be? Hopefully you can see that it's the barium sulfate that's more soluble. And why is that? Well, that's because its KSP value is larger in magnitude. You know, 10 to the minus 10th, still a small number, but it's a lot larger than 10 to the minus 17th, isn't it? So the larger the value of KSP, the more soluble it's normally going to be. Let's do one more example here to emphasize and, and practice. So here we have the KSP for magnesium fluoride. And it is 5.16 times 10 to the negative 11th. So let's start by writing the equation for the dissociation of magnesium fluoride in water. That's part A. Once again, we have to know how to write the formula for magnesium fluoride all the way back from first year chemistry, right? So magnesium fluoride is MgF2. And we know that it's going to have to break apart into its component ions. So we'll have some magnesium ions. And we'll have 
look at that, two fluoride ions. So it's going to look like this. So there's our balanced equation for the dissociation of this stuff in water. Now part B says, what is the equilibrium constant expression? Once again, it's going to be products over reactants raised to the power of the coefficients. So we're going to leave out this solid here because solids are never put into equilibrium, are they? So it's just mg2 plus times f minus squared. Don't forget that squared because that 2 out in front there implies we've got to square the fluoride. Well, let's go on to part C. Let's calculate the molar solubility of the magnesium fluoride in water in this uh, process. Well, we have our balanced equation here. and the molar solubility is, is what we're trying to find. So we don't know what that is. Let's call it x. And so if this is x, then you know it's a 1 to 1 ratio of magnesium fluoride to magnesium. So magnesium will be x as well, won't it? And then the fluoride, it's a 1 to 2 ratio. So that's going to be 2x, isn't it? So we'll put that in here. Well, now we can take these values and plug them into KSP, this expression back here. So KSP is 5.16 times 10 to the negative 11. So that goes in there for KSP. Our Mg2 plus is x, and our fluoride is 2x. So we're going to plug those in to that part of the expression. When we evaluate this, 2x quantity squared is 4x squared. And multiply it by this x. So that's actually 4x cubed, isn't it, whenever we evaluate this. We can, uh, we can divide both sides by 4. And then take the cube root to find the value of x. x is actually going to be 2.35 times 10 to the negative fourth. So guess what? That means that the molar solubility of magnesium fluoride is that x. It's 2.35 times 10 to the negative fourth moles per liter. That's how much magnesium fluoride you can dissolve in water. It's not that much, is it? So let's go on to part D. Let's calculate the solubility of this compound in grams per liter. Well, here we have it in moles per liter. So we just have that next step converted to grams per liter. So we're going to write this out here. 2.35 times 10 to the negative fourth moles of magnesium fluoride for every one liter. And our job is to convert this to grams per liter down at the end. So we're going to have a conversion factor. We're going to have to put one mole on the bottom down here and grams on top. Now we just have to look at the periodic table and see how many grams are in a mole of this. You know, magnesium is about uh, 24.3, fluoride, fluorine is about 19. When you add it up, it's about 62.30 grams in a mole. So now we can cancel moles. And we can multiply these across. And we find that the solubility of this in grams per liter is about 0.0146 grams per liter. So that means that at this temperature, you could measure out 0.0146 grams of magnesium fluoride and dissolve it in a liter of, solu uh, in a liter of solution. And it would be saturated at that, at that temperature. So hopefully you can see now how to solve these KSP problems, how to solve for molar solubility, how to solve for solubility in grams per liter, how to solve for KSP if you're going the other direction. I hope you've learned something from this video. If, you've ha if you have, if you'd be so kind as to hit that like button and to subscribe to my channel, I would really appreciate it. That way YouTube will recommend my videos to other chemistry students. Like I said, my name is Jeremy Krug. I've been teaching chemistry for decades, and I want you to get a 5 on your AP exam and to make an A in your chemistry class. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again where we can learn some more chemistry together.